Well, this is different, but we are glad that you have joined us today. We have several announcements before we lean into a time of worship today that has been prepared for you to uplift your spirits, uh, to feed your soul. We hope that you will be blessed by what we have brought together today. First of all, we want everyone to know that the staff is working diligently to provide digital uh, virtual options for material and community for all age groups. This video is just one example of that. So be patient with us as we adapt to this new normal uh, and feel free to contact any of us if you have any questions at the office at cookvillefumc.org. Also be sure to follow us on Facebook and Instagram and check our website frequently so you don't miss any of this content. Uh, we also encourage you to subscribe to the bi-weekly newsletter either in mail form or in virtual form uh, that we'll be sending out. Uh, so send an email if you are interested in subscribing to the uh, virtual form specifically. Uh, you can do that through office at cookvillefumc.org. And uh, all of these uh, newsletters are also available uh, under the resources tab on our website. Second, per the governor of Tennessee's recent order regarding schools uh, closing until April 24th, Cookville FUMC will be closed for all activities until April 5th and will be evaluating on a week-by-week -week basis after that. Staff will be in and out uh, of the building, rotating uh, in small groups as needed, uh, just so that you know that is happening as well. Uh, third, this is again an odd time, but there are always needs for pastoral care. Help the staff in this time by emailing any need you know of to Jessica Welch at connecting at cookvillefumc.org. Uh, fourth, the food pantry is moving to an appointment only system, so operations are not going to be as they were for a while now, uh, but we know that we are doing good work and we want the church to know that we are still serving the needy among us best we can, uh, so that's why we're doing it by an appointment system where those that have needs can make an appointment, can come by, can receive uh, what they need specifically, and also that contact is limited between person to person. Uh, again, the, contact the office with any questions, uh, with this specifically, and ask for Tamika Parker, our Director of Servant Ministries. Fifth, we also ask that you continue giving in these times so that we can pay staff and keep our ministries going uh, in whatever form they end up uh, going out in. You can send a check to First United Methodist Church uh, at 165 East Broad Street. That's our physical address. Or feel free to call Luann, our Office Administrator, at 526-2177 to discuss auto-drafting options for your contribution. That's also something that is available. Uh, lastly, if you're looking for a specific way to help, uh, we all know that surgical masks are in great need all around the country, and Cookville FUMC is calling on all those with sewing talent or ability to help make surgical masks for the staff at CRMC, that's Cookville Regional Medical Center. Uh, the needs are sewers, pattern cutters, non-polyester material, uh, shoelaces, bias tape. If you have gently worn flannel shirts, men's cotton shirts or sheets, those can also be used. Uh, pattern will be provided. Uh, if you want to be a part of this team, contact D. Potnik at 248-0530. That sounds like a great ministry opportunity, something we can specifically do to help our doctors and nurses who are on the front lines uh, taking care of us. So, again, welcome. Uh, this is the part where we would usually pass the peace to one another in hopes that that peace would flow to one another through us, through our community, and through the world. Uh, and this might be awkward in this kind of way that we are doing church now, but it's an important exercise. So imagine as we do this that you are sending peace to everyone watching, that there are people that need peace, that there are people with anxiety in their lives, that there are people that are watching way too much news right now, and they need to be reminded of the peace of Christ. So, may the peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. Amen. Thank you again for joining us today, and may the peace that surpasses all understanding fill your heart today as we worship together.
God of life, present and promise, you are the one to whom we call, for you are the one who hears, and you are the one who acts, bringing us new life with your grace and love and power. Lead us in our time of worship that we may be prepared to follow your lead in places where life is at risk, places where hope seems far away, places where dreams die during sleep. When our time together has passed, help us live the teachings we proclaim within this time of worship through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. modern affirmation. Let us affirm our faith. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the Word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to love and serve others to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus crucified and risen, our judge and our hope in life, in death, in life beyond death. God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Amen.
words of the psalmist, Psalm 130. I cry out to you from the depths, Lord. My Lord, listen to my voice. Let your ears pay close attention to my request for mercy. If you kept track of sins, Lord, my Lord, who would stand a chance? But forgiveness is with you. That's why you are honored. I hope, Lord. My whole being hopes, and I wait for God's promise. My whole being waits for my Lord, more than the night watch waits for morning. Yes, more than the night watch waits for morning. Israel, wait for the Lord, because faithful love is with the Lord, because great redemption is with our God. He is the one who will redeem Israel from all its sin.
Good morning again. We are glad you are joining us uh, in this format again. We thank you for being with us. As we enter our prayer time, we want to remember this morning um, all of those survivors of the tornadoes from a few weeks back, those that lost their homes or loved ones, uh, those that lost peace of mind, uh, those that are still struggling with trauma and anxiety, and all of us coping with a new normal from that. And then on top of this, we have this virus that has come, uh, and we pray for all those that are sick, all those that are in fear, uh, all those that have people that they are trying to take care of. We pray for our doctors and nurses. There's so much to pray for today. We also want you to remember to pray for those names that you would see in your bulletin, whether you receive the bulletin through the mail or through uh, a digital format, continue to pray for those names as well. Uh, and join us in this prayer. Do not let this prayer be where the prayer ends, but let it be a prayer that spurs on more prayer. Then maybe there are ideas in this prayer that can help you in your prayer life as you pray for others, our community, yourself, the world, whatever that might be. So we ask that you join us as we pray to listen for what God is speaking to you through this prayer that he might want you to pray about in this time and in this place. Let us pray together. Holy God, we are scared and we are confused and we are angry. We are worried. We've seen the best of people just a few weeks ago when so many selflessly gave of themselves and what they had to serve and bless others when the tornadoes that suddenly changed our community forever, when those came. And we also have seen the worst of people, people who hoarded for themselves more than they needed in the face of a pandemic. Those people are like us. We have seen the best and worst in others, and if we are honest, we have seen it in ourselves. This is a hard thing for us to grasp, O oh Lord, that we are both light and dark, good and bad, selfless and selfish. We see it now maybe more clearly than ever, but we also see doctors and nurses who are also scared, who also have families taking their place between the sickness and their communities. Thank you for their courage. Bless them, protect them, calm them. In them we see the best of ourselves and the reflection of your son who stood between sin and death and us taking it on himself. We also see now, Father, the courage of so-called everyday people, grocery store workers and truck drivers and restaurant workers and delivery people. These are the stations in our culture that are not praised enough as our thanks and admiration often goes to celebrities and athletes. May we see each of these people as the miracle they are, as essential, and not forget that God has always seen them this way, that you have always seen them this way. Give them protection and calm as well. May we also see those around us, our neighbors and our family, what blessings they are, God. May we also see them as essential. May we not return when this time lifts to a life of such busyness and hustle that we forget to be with them, pray for them, and learn from them. Thank you for exposing this time, the idols of our schedules and our hobbies and our love of money over neighbor and our incredible lack of thankfulness for the blessings we have and that we take for granted. Give us patience, O oh God, with those around us and with ourselves as we learn and relearn this. Lord of life, we specifically ask that you be with those who are sick, those who have died, and those who have lost loved ones. Bring meaning where it can be found and bring comfort in the midst of a time where so many are saying goodbye before they thought they would have to do so. God, I do not believe that you caused this, but I do believe that you are working now through it to bring about good. Give us eyes to see how and where. Help us to be open in this time to learning about ourselves, maybe especially the parts of ourselves that we try to keep tucked away behind our busyness. Give us your love to be merciful to ourselves, and may we see that all things that are not built on you are flimsy foundations at best, O oh God. Thank you for reminding us of this, and in that we ask for the courage to find our hope in you and not in ourselves. For only you are faithful, only you are good, only you have defeated death. Help us find our ultimate hope in you, O oh God, even as we find now that maybe our hope had been placed elsewhere. 
Make us Christians again, O God, the people of the empty grave who know in our minds and our hearts that death is not the end. Turn our focus here in this time and let us not give into the temptation of distraction as you call us to you through even this. Teach us in this time and help us to learn again who we are in light of who you are. And let us not forget that. That includes how we pray, O oh God. So we pray now the prayer your Son taught us to pray in one voice in many different places. But all together we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, O oh God, for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen and amen. From the 11th chapter of John. Now, a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sisters went, sent word to Jesus. Lord, the one you love is sick. When he heard this, Jesus said, This sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory, so that God's Son may be glorified through it. Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. Yet, when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. Then he said to his disciples, Let us go back to Judea. Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to wake him up. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Your brother will rise again. I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live, even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who was to come into the world. And after she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary aside. The teacher is here and is asking for you. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Now, Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who had been with Mary in the house comforting her noticed how quickly she got up and went out, they followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to mourn there. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him? Come and see, Lord. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, See how he loved him? But some of them said, Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone. But, Lord, by this time there is a bad odor, for he has been there four days. Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me. But I said this for the benefit of the people standing here that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his feet and hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to him, Take off the grave clothes and let him go.
Good morning, beloved. We continue to worship remotely and so pleased that everyone can uh, join us this morning and even by radio. We welcome you to this time of worship together. T.S. Eliot wrote, April is the cruelest month. Reading lilacs out of the dead land, mixing memory and desire, stirring dull roots with spring rain. It's almost April. I don't know about you, but some of these mornings seem awfully cold for this late in the spring, but that's not uncommon. Spring is pushing its way up to the dead earth, and it's blooming all around us, and we give God thanks for that. You know, spring rain is a harbinger of the warmth and the new life to come. This year, like every year, I found myself watching and waiting for the daffodils, or what I call buttercups, some of them right here. I always watch for the buttercups to bloom. Sometime it's even in late February, sometime through March, and we're not always sure how long they'll last, but um, I always watch because for me they are a sign of new life, the promise of new life that perseveres and pushes up through the cold earth as a sign of beauty and hope and life. And so I brought this uh, clear planter this morning. Uh, it has some buttercups in it that were, uh, have sprung from um, the bulbs that were placed there a few months ago. Last year at this time, we moved to Cookville. And as we were moving in, Monty and Michelle Gall gave us this arrangement of buttercups has some high stuff in it, but we held on to that, and the flowers were beautiful. It reminded us of spring, and it was a great hospitality gift as we moved in a year ago this month. So Kathy saved the bulbs, and uh, a few months ago, a couple of months ago, she placed them in this clear planter and look at them today. They're blooming a year later. So whenever I see buttercups, I feel a surge of hope. Spring has triumphed again. Life and hope have triumphed again. And so we all need to watch for those moments of grace when we're reminded, just like when the buttercups bloom, that that's the cycle of life. That's the grace of God at work. When I was 13 years old, my family went through a particularly rough season. My parents were separated for a period of time. And as a 13-year-old, naturally, I found that very scary and very disorienting. And so as a teenager, that's a memorable time. Over spring break that year, I went to spend a week with my dad's parents, my grandparents who lived on the farm in southeast Missouri. And I've said, I've shared with you before, the farm was like a wonderland. It was a safe haven for me. And so we spent that spring break at the farm. And I remember it vividly. That year was, uh, that week of that year was a, a beautiful, warm spring break week even in southeast Missouri. But what was so interesting about it is that was Holy Week, and I remember th three things very vividly about the end of that week. The first thing I remember, that Friday, Good Friday, the day before we were to leave, come home to Tennessee, that Good Friday was a warm, beautiful day for the first half of the day, and then... All at once, clouds started rolling in. It got colder and colder and colder. And by late afternoon, it came a late March snow. I couldn't believe it. It just snowed and snowed. And we got about three inches of snow after it had been so warm. And so that was on Good Friday. The second thing I remember about that Good Friday was that evening, my grandparents 
uh, took us to church. It was the Good Friday service at the little church where I was baptized, Crossroads United Methodist Church. I don't remember a whole lot about that service, but I do remember that when we got home, my grandparents asked me and my twin sister to physically kneel at our bedside. And so we all knelt, my twin sister and my grandparents, we knelt by the bedside and we began to pray for my family. And so I remember that very vividly. Then the last thing I remember so vividly about that Good Friday, that one of the last days of March of that year, spring break, the warmth, the snow, Good Friday. But then that Saturday morning we got up, we loaded up in the car about sunrise, and we started home. And it was, at that moment, a broken home. And so I remember vividly riding along in the back seat, looking out the, the window at the light appearing and shining over the landscape. And so as we pulled out with that sunlight of sunrise on that Saturday morning between Good Friday and Easter, as we were riding along, I began to notice the fence rows, the hilltops of my grandfather's farm, and then all through the neighborhood, their neighborhood, we got out on the highway, riding down the highway, other homes. I began to notice that there were buttercups poking their heads up through the snow. And that image of the beautiful yellow poking up to the glistening white snow was etched in my mind and my heart and my soul. It was a sign of hope. And so each year I wait and I watch for the buttercups to bloom. Harbingers of spring. And the triumph of life and hope once again. When the buttercups bloom, we know that God is at work to renew both life and our broken our brokenness in our lives and is always at work to push back the power of death. So when the buttercups bloom, it is a sign of hope. The French novelist Albert Camus was actually an agnostic. He helped shape the emergence of existential philosophy. But he once famously said, in the midst of winter, I found that there was within me an invincible summer. In the midst of winter, I found within me an invincible summer. He went on to say, and that makes me happy, for it says that no matter how hard the world pushes against me, within me there is something stronger, something better, pushing right back. As people of faith, we believe that thing that pushes right back is the power of God, the presence of God, the transformational love of God. And so God is constantly pushing back against the power of death. So every year for me, when the buttercups bloom, it is spring's earliest reminder that God is pushing back against the power of death to bring life. And that power of life has been poured into each one of us. And so within each of us, even as hard as any season may be, there is an invincible spring, an invincible summer just waiting to appear. So we need to remember that. Today's lectionary is a tough one for the circumstances we face in this pandemic. It focuses on the death of Lazarus. I have to admit that I almost chickened out. I wanted to preach something a little bit lighter, maybe more superficial and cheery. I was tempted. 
We need things that will lift our spirits. But I also realized that this is probably the word that we need to hear this week. In the midst of the heaviness, the uncertainty, the anxiety, and even to some extent the fear of a historic pandemic. And so this story of Lazarus is a reminder again of God's continually pushing back against the power of death. And that even when the earth is still in the grasp of death, the buttercups will bloom. And so we know the story of Lazarus. It takes place in the midst of Jesus' journey toward Jerusalem and the cross. It's a vital aspect of the story. He is going from Jericho to Bethany to Jerusalem to the cross. And so on his way, he is headed toward the home of what I'm convinced are some people who are his closest, personal, intimate friends. Lazarus and his two sisters, Mary and Martha. And so Jesus is going to his personal haven before the events of the Passover and his journey to Calvary. And so as he's making his way toward Bethany, he's involved in his ministry, he's delayed along the way, and so word comes that his friend, perhaps his best personal friend, Lazarus, has died. And so it takes a while for Jesus to continue on in the journey. But by the time he arrives, he's late. Lazarus has been in the tomb dead for four days. And so as he approaches the village, as he approaches this personal haven, then Martha runs out along the roadside leading into town. She runs from her home out to greet Jesus, and she is full of anguish. And I suspect as you read this, it's even a harsh tone that she uses with her friend, her beloved friend Jesus. If you had been here sooner, my brother would not have died. She is full of of anguish and grief. But notice what Jesus says. Your brother will rise again. For here, my brother, your brother, his death will point to the glory of God. It's in this moment that Jesus says, for I, one of the I am sayings, I am the resurrection of and the life. Whoever believes in me will live even though he dies. And so it's one of the I am sayings. But he says, I am the resurrection and the life. And so they continue along the road into town, into Bethany. He reaches the home of Martha and Mary, his dear friends, this haven that he has enjoyed. But Lazarus is not there. And so when he enters the home, Scripture says he is deeply moved in spirit and is troubled. Jesus feels this loss personally. That's what the story is telling us. And so in two words, it captures it. It says, Jesus weeps. John eleven thirty five. 35. You may remember the Trivial Pursuit game. That was one of the answers. What is the shortest verse in the Bible? It's John eleven thirty five. 35. Jesus weeps. There's nothing trivial about that. Even for Jesus, death has become very personal. 
Orthodox theology describes Jesus as the most unique being who has ever existed. A mysterious hybrid God-man. Fully divine, fully human. So where does his divinity begin and end? And how is it woven like a tapestry into his humanity? Well, here is his humanity. Jesus enters into our human condition fully. And precisely in this moment, death becomes a very personal reality and loss, even for Jesus. And so much like us, for Jesus, the loss of Lazarus is a deep, anguished, intimate, gut-wrenching, soul-testing loss of his most beloved friend. Even for Jesus, the mysterious God-man. Here is his humanity. He enters our reality fully. Jesus weeps. And so what's amazing is what follows is a preview of Easter. Jesus saying, I, I am the resurrection and the life. Jesus summons Lazarus from the tomb. He commands Lazarus to come forth from the tomb. And so the literal meaning of resurrection is to stand up. And so as Jesus summons him from the tomb, Lazarus stands up. He stands up against death. He takes off the grave clothing and he walks out. It's at once both a miraculous and a surreal, but yet even a comical scene. It's, there, it's just so very real. Right before they roll back the stone, again, Martha, the practical one, says, warns that, you know, he's been in there four days, there's going to be an odor. She's always the practical one. Get ready, this isn't going to smell really very well. And so sure enough, they roll back the stone and Jesus summons Lazarus to stand up. Be resurrected. Stand up against death. And Lazarus, their beloved friend and family, comes walking out of the tomb. And so Jesus reminds them that they are seeing the glory of God on display. That's the reason, Jesus says. I am the resurrection and the life. And this is an opportunity to see the glory of God revealed. That's a theme. That's a thread all the way through the gospel of John. Every occasion, every circumstance, good or bad. Either at the greatest joy of a wedding or standing at a grave can become an occasion for the goodness and the grace and the glory and the life-surging power of God to be on display. And so sure enough, at Jesus' command, as Lazarus stands up and walks out of the grave, the glory of God is on display. And so we get to be part of that. We get to be part of this episode that Jesus includes us in where we see the glory of God because we are close to Jesus like Mary and Martha and Lazarus. We get a preview of Easter, maybe even when we need it most. The raising of Lazarus from the dead is a spectacular reminder that God is continually pushing back against the power of death. We need to hear that 
today. Our God is the God of life. Our God is one who provides the ultimate defeat of death, which is eternal life. Jesus alone accomplishes that. So almost like an affirmation of faith, yes, we can say, yes, Jesus is the resurrection and the life. And we get a preview. The raising of Lazarus. And so, when we see the glory of God on display, we can make all of our affirmations of faith in Jesus. Even when we see the buttercups bloom, they announce to us the glory of God. God is at work for good. God is a God of grace who is continually at work for our good, our life. And he is pushing back against the power of death. And so, remember that. When you feel the heaviness of these days, when you feel the anxiety creeping up, the fear creeping up, the power of death is at work, then remember that, that God is continually at work for good. God's grace is continual. His continuous loving action in the world and it is God through Jesus who pushes back the power of death and even the buttercup blooming can reassure us in our times of anxiety or fear or even our greatest loss when death becomes personal for us All this week, I have found myself remembering how doing all of these funerals through the years, how they increasingly, and even to some degree cumulatively, became more and more personal for me. They become personal experiences of loss, as they are for you. When I was an associate pastor at Mullins United Methodist in Memphis, we had a a men's prayer breakfast that met every Wednesday morning, rain or shine, any time of the year. If it was Wednesday, except maybe for Christmas, the men were together for the Wednesday prayer breakfast. And so I started as a young associate and You know how folks are, church folks. We find our seat and we keep it. And so I found a seat and I sat down beside a man who would become a dear, dear friend. He was an older gentleman um, that I sat by every single Wednesday morning. His name was Harry Bays. And so every Wednesday morning for over four years, I sat down beside Harry Bays, and he became a cherished friend. Harry was a gentle, quiet soul. He was a humble, faithful servant. And he was just always kind of around the church, one of those uh, fix-it-up kind of guys. But he and I became very close friends. He was almost like a father figure to me. And so he would do the odd jobs around church. He would tend, I remember specifically, he would tend the flower beds all around the church. And so as the years went by, we always looked forward to seeing it one another. We sat by each other every Wednesday. And little did I know that Harry would become the very first person that I actually saw die. I actually saw him take his last breath. He had lung cancer. Our senior pastor had had surgery, and so I was on call, on duty at all hours, and so... I knew he was very sick. He had been in and out of the hospital. But one night 
up in the middle of the night, I got a call to come to the ICU unit at Methodist Hospital in Memphis. And so as I walked in, I sat down beside the bed and I prayed with Harry. And as I held his hand, he literally took his last breath. And as a young person, even as a young pastor, I had done a number of funerals at that point over several years. But at that point, death became very, very personal for me. I'd never seen anyone actually die, actually take their last breath. So death was no longer just conceptual. It wasn't just conducting a funeral. It wasn't dealing with a grieving family. I'd done all of that before. But Harry was my Lazarus. And with his last breath, death became very, very personal. And so you've been there. Many other deaths have followed my friend Harry Bays. I've conducted hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of funerals. I have stood at the grave of my own daughter five days after her birth. I never imagined I would be there. I have stood at the grave of three of my beloved grandparents, of my mother, and of a dearly beloved father-in-law. In time, death becomes more personal for all of us. But here's the thing. Here's the thing. Death comes near. And as death comes near and even becomes personal for us, that's when our anxiety and our fear of death and even some measure of our loss can be displaced by the divine gifts of hope and faith and resilience. John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, displayed this at his own death. He said the best of all is that God is with us. And so even when death becomes very, very personal, God instills within us an invincible summer. The bulbs of promise have been planted and the buttercups of hope and life will bloom again. Because Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. I love the hymn. It's called Hymn of Promise, number 707. I'm going to read the words. Now think of these buttercups. And I'd invite you to watch and wait for signs of the glory of God and the hope that God provides. In the bulb there is a flower. In the seed an apple tree. In cocoons a hidden promise. Butterflies will soon be free. In the cold and snow of winter there's a spring that waits to be. Unrevealed until it's season, something God alone can see. There's a song in every silence, seeking word and melody. There's a dawn in every darkness, bringing hope to you and me. From the past will come the future, what it holds a mystery, unrevealed until it's season, something God alone can see. In our end is our beginning, in our time, infinity. In our doubt there is believing, in our life, eternity. In our death, a resurrection, at the last, a victory. 
unrevealed until its season. Something God alone can see. We sang that hymn at Harry's funeral. My beloved friend, Harry Bays. And do you know what I said at Harry's funeral? I said, we weep now. Our loss is deep. It is soul deep. It is personal. But wait and watch. Even in the last gasp, the last grasp of winter, the buttercup bulbs that Harry tended at the church will bloom. And they did. God is with us. Jesus enters into our experience of death personally. This whole episode of the dying and rising of Lazarus happens on the road to Calvary. Jesus suffered and died a death more painful than any death we will ever know or witness. Jesus died that death for us. And with the rising of Lazarus, he gives us a preview of Easter, a preview of his own rising, a sign of hope, a reminder that God continually pushes back against death and ultimately brings an invincible Eternal spring. And so as hard as any season of our life may be, as hard and as difficult and as challenging and full of anxiety and uncertainty this time may be, this season may be, just watch and wait and believe. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. When the buttercups bloom, as they are now, we know that God is at work to bring hope and life and healing for our brokenness and the gift of eternal life. And we experience all of those gifts personally. And so glory to God. By the grace of God, spring and hope and healing and life triumph. Glory to God. And so it's getting a little late. The cold earth is giving way to the harbingers of spring. But as we move closer to Holy Week, Stop and watch and wait and look and take in the beauty of the buttercup. It's a sign of hope. It's a sign of life. God is with us. And within us, there's an invincible summer. An eternal gift of life. Because Jesus is the resurrection, and the life. Glory to God. Amen. Precious Lord, take my hand.
that God is with us. May the God of grace and peace be with you all and know that God comes alongside of us and walks with us and sustains us. So walk with confidence. Behold the beauty of spring, the promise of Easter, and know that Jesus is the resurrection and the life. And so may the peace of Christ rule in your hearts always. Amen.